normally with most objects, when I try to push something, like this remote, it moves in the direction that I'm pushing it. Similarly, if I try to rotate it, it rotates in the direction that I'm rotating it. But it's different from gyroscopes. If I try to rotate this gyroscope towards, like upwards, it moves towards the camera. And as soon as I let it drop, it moves away from the camera. So upwards, downwards, upwards, downwards. I suppose I might have to take my word for it. There are a lot of ways to try to kind of understand what's going on, although a lot of them also use college level math. The most intuitive way I've found is that when I'm holding it like this, it's spinning in one direction. It's spinning like this. Uh, and and if I were to kind of manually rotate it like that, now it's spinning the other way. And you have to wonder, where did that angular momentum, where did that spin go? And the answer is that it went into me. That was the force that I felt when I was trying to rotate it. It was, you know, it was putting the torque into me. And if, for example, I had been, you know, in the middle of space, um, floating and not like touching any surface, then if I had been spinning um, clockwise and you know, and then I rotate it to spin counterclockwise, then I would have a very small spin in the clockwise direction. While we're at it, let's talk about spin. If you have two different objects that are spinning, how do you relate them? How do you tell someone else what's going on, like if you're talking to them over the phone? Um, do you just, you know, if I'm trying to describe something spinning direction, do I just take my finger and be like, okay, it's going like this? In physics, we take our right hand and we roll our fingers in the direction of spin. So, for example, if it's spinning clockwise from the camera's point of view, I would spin my fingers clockwise. And then all that really matters is what direction my thumb is pointing in. So, if it's spinning like that, that way it's spinning counterclockwise that way. This is sometimes referred to as the right hand rule and can actually help you uh, figure out if you need to unscrew something. You, you, know, you want to go away from the screw so you have to rotate in this direction. So this way. And if you want to screw something in, you're going into the object. And so you want to spin it this way. So what does all this have to do with NMR? Well, it turns out that if you have an odd number nucleus, it acts like a tiny gyroscope when you put it in a magnetic field. There are two ways to think about this, the classical way and the quantum way, and they both basically give the same results. I'll explain the classical way first. Classically speaking, this uh, hydrogen nucleus kind of acts like a bar magnet. That's because it's got spin and it's got a charge, you know, it's a hydrogen nucleus, so it's positive. And so, yeah, so it's kind of like a tiny bar magnet. And if you put this magnet near an external magnetic field, it's going to try to line up with it. But, like we said earlier, because it's, uh, it's got spin to it, instead of lining up with it, it's going to precess. One interesting thing is that if we kind of put it perpendicular to the ground, we see that it's kind of spinning at a certain speed. And if we start it out closer to facing the ground, and by spinning I mean precessing, we see that it's precessing basically at the same speed. I guess not anymore because we got confused, but if we have like a slight angle to it. And if we start it out closer to facing the ground, and by spinning I mean precessing, we see that it's precessing basically at the same speed. I guess not anymore because we got confused, but if we have like a slight angle to it. So the reason that it precesses at the same speed both times is because the precession depends on 
the spin, like how fast this thing is spinning, and the force, like the external field of gravity. And there's this uh, extra component here called the cross product, which is just a fancy say way of saying um, the angle between the two. So right here, they're facing the same direction, right? Because um, gravity is pointing up and down and the spin is spinning up and down. And then here, they're spinning uh, perpendicular to each other, right? And the cross product, basically the more farther away the angles are, so like the more perpendicular they are, the bigger this number is gonna be. And so, uh, yeah, but the other thing is that when it's close to almost pointing at the ground, it's, uh, it doesn't have very far to spin, right? Compared to here where it's gotta go all the way around. And those two effects, the fact that it spins slower or there's less force when it's uh, closer to, you know, parallel with gravity and um, that there's less just distance to go, those counteract each other. And so that's why, that's why these uh, basically precession effects, any, any thing that precesses, uh, doesn't care what the angle is. There's just one magical number at which it precesses. So this precession around the external magnetic field, right, if the field's pointing that way, then this thing's gonna wanna precess around it. That's called the Larmor precession. So in the water, we have the H2O, And so each one of these hydrogens in the water acts like a tiny bar magnet. And when we, so normally they're just kind of pointing in one direction, whatever direction, um, but then in Earth's magnetic field, they kind of try to line up. And then the transceiver coil that we saw in the previous video kind of gives it like a nudge. And that nudge kind of gets it like precessing. Basically, once we get it out of equilibrium, it wants to get back into equilibrium. And so it kind of wiggles around that, uh, that equilibrium that it's trying to get back to. And this wiggling, um, if you take into account the strength of the Earth's magnetic field and the spin that the hydrogen nuclei have, it gives you this number, um, which turns out to be around 2,000 hertz, or around 2,000 times per second. Now I'm not fast enough to wiggle this back and forth 2,000 times per second, but what I can do is play you this annoying screeching noise that is what your ears would hear if you could, you know, if they were sensitive enough to hear these atoms. That being a two kilohertz frequency. Quantum mechanically, we have a similar system. The first thing you have to realize is that quantum means clumpy. In other words, you can't have half a quantum spin or half a quantum energy. You basically have like one whole quantum and you can't divide it. It's got to stay whole. Um, so for example, if a system has potential energy, like if the, the gyroscope is spinning and it's kind of got some potential energy, right? Because it could... Like let's say it's it's hanging from the rope like this and you got the gyroscope and it's spinning like that. Um, it's got some potential energy right here where it could fall down. Um, and in, in quantum land, there is no halfway in between the two. It's, it's basically either up, either we find it up or we find it down. So the fact that a gyroscope, a gyroscope has to go either spin up or spin down in the quantum land um, means that, so there aren't any like spaces in any uh, values in between. It's, it's either up or down. Um, we only find it up or down. There's uh, superpositions of both. So it, it can be like, so if we, if we drew a plot um, where this is how much up it is, and this is weird because um, we are, you know, I'm saying up and down, but I'm, I'm drawing them sideways. So, you know, we have, I guess, an up an arrow and a down arrow here. Um, the wave function, basically what's really going on deep down in, in quantum land 
can look like this. So part of it, you know, the shadow kind of lies here on the in this direction. Let me. Um, okay. Um, so this part right here is the kind of if you multiply that by itself, um, that gives you the chances of finding it facing down, and then the shadow on this side. So basically, this part right here gives you the chances of finding it uh, facing up. And um, in quantum land, it you know we've got this diagonal arrow, but we're never going to see this diagonal arrow. Like we're never going to observe it. We only observe you know up or down. So the fact that we're only going to see it up or, or we're going to see it down means that there aren't any there aren't going to be any uh, spaces when it goes when it when the when the uh, quantum gyroscope the the nucleus of the atom flips from being up to being down or from being down to being up. Uh, we're never going to see anyone in between, any states in between. There's no like sideways, and it's almost like it's leaping from going down to going up. And that's why, why that's what when you hear someone saying quantum leap, that's what that means. It's that the the state just goes directly from one to the other. There's no halfway uh, state for it to go to. So these uh, you can imagine that if we have a state where we have up and a state where we have down. So, you know, it's it's spinning. Oh, let, me, let me use my right hand rule right here. Uh, right, so then it's spinning like that. And then we have, you know, spinning the other direction. So we have spin up and spin down. And uh, since we have two states, this makes it easy to just kind of uh, overlay this mathematically and call one of them uh, one and call the other one zero so that we have like bits now you know but they're quantum bits and so that's what we refer to as qubits so qubits are great but how do we make a computer well computers are basically large uh logic crunching machines so for example if you have now this is called an and gate and well let me you know, do it from your point of view so we have this and gate and we have two inputs so let's say that's one that's a zero and it gives us an output using logic so um if we were to crunch if we were to let a computer crunch this it'd be like okay do i see one yes do i, do I see one at the bottom no so i didn't see and i didn't see both you know a and b so this would be a zero another type of gate is called the or gate and I'm just going to go through this one quickly and looks like that. And uh, um, that one is basically, you know, let's say we got um, zero and one this time. We look at the first input and is it this one? No. Or is it the second one? Well, yes, it was the second one. So we get a, a one right there. Uh, so another kind of gate is called the controlled not gate. And that's the one where you're going to focus on today. Um, and that one goes like this. So we've got, so I guess we should probably talk about the not gate first. The not gate, um, let's go over here. So the not gate is super simple. It's basically, if you give it a one, it's going to give you zero and vice versa. If you give it a zero, it's going to give you a one. It's just an inverting gate. The controlled not gate looks like this. This is the symbol for it. And what it does is if you, so we have like a controller and we have a uh, control E or, you know, a target. And basically if your first gate um, is on, then this guy is going to get inverted. So that would be a zero. And we just kind of ignore what happens up there, but it's basically nothing. So that stays the one. And then let's say this guy was a, uh, a zero, then nothing would happen to this guy, and he just continues along normally, so he'd stay at one. So how do we do a controlled NOT gate using our NMR system? Uh, because if we can do that, then we can start doing computations. And so imagine we have a molecule, which, and there's a bunch of them, chloroform, actually I think chloroform doesn't control, doesn't let the H touch the F, but either way, let's have a hydrogen and we'll have a fluorine in the same uh, molecule 
because they both have an odd number of nucleons uh, without being radioactive. And, and so that's, that's what we need for them to act as tiny bar magnets. And so um, basically we can imagine them as tiny bar magnets. Like that. And if we put them in an external magnetic field, then they are going to affect each other so like that. And so, so basically what's going to happen is um, if we pluck this guy right here, uh, this hydrogen, we can imagine it like that. If we pluck it, it's going to start to, to oscillate. Um, it's going to want to, you know, do its flippy thing. But the thing is, it's going to have, it's going to be affected by the magnetic field from this guy, right? Because this guy has a magnetic field that's coming out too. And depending on if this guy's facing up or down, it's going to either add to the Earth's magnetic field or it's going to take away from it. And um, like we said earlier, we have this uh, formula. Um, and by formula, I mean kind of like mathematical idea. It's, it's, you know, it's not precise, but it kind of gives you an idea where the amount of uh, spinning, how fast it's, how fast the precession occurs depends on the the spin of the object and I just realized I'm doing this backwards so you'll have to bear with me um, cross the magnetic field and so um, you can see that if the field goes up then the precession rate goes up or by field I mean the local field that it's seeing because this you know this number right here the spin is not really going to change and if you know it's vice versa if this field goes down the the precession rate goes down. There's a type of operation called a spin flip, where if, for example, this hydrogen isn't precessing at the rate that we had expected to, then we don't see the signal at all. And so you can see that with some clever uh, signals between, you know, sending frequencies to this guy and sending frequencies to this guy and kind of precessing them at the right rates, uh, we can. Basically, if we tell this guy to do something, we can see a signal from this guy. And if we tell this guy to do something else, we don't see a signal from this guy. So you can see how that's kind of like a controlled not gate because um, this guy would do its own thing, but it kind of gets flipped if um, this guy is doing something else. You may then say, quantum gates are cool, but when can I play Angry Birds? And you have a fair point. So. Quantum computers aren't made to play games, at least not in the near future. Um, but eventually I, I plan to explain something called Shor's algorithm, which um, it, it's a quantum way to solve a problem that affects things that we do every single day on our phones and on our computers. Um, but it's going to take a bit more skill on my part to explain it and um, to kind of simulate it or to run it on my quantum device. Um, so until then, I plan on taking a couple of detours. Right now I'm working on trying to get imaging on my device and hopefully that improves my understanding. If that sounds interesting to, to you, uh, feel free to subscribe and until then, stay crunchy.